Good morning, it's good to be here. Um, this sermon that I am about to deliver, I was supposed to deliver last week, um, as many of you will be aware, uh, but uh, I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about what happened, um, for those of you who don't know. Uh, last Sunday I received a call that, that my dad, who was in Jersey, had collapsed and he had been diagnosed with a ruptured aortic aneurysm, which um, for us normal people who don't understand those words, basically the main blood vessel in his body had burst. Normally you don't survive something like that. Um, and the hospital facilities in Jersey did not have the means to deal with it. And so he was flown over by helicopter to Bournemouth Hospital. Um, and that's where I saw him last Sunday morning. And um, I just thought I'd give you an update. I thank you so much, all of you, for praying. Um, he is alive, and that is amazing, considering what he went through. He went through uh, a very serious operation, the kind of thing you have once in a lifetime, and there's only a chance you could survive it. We had three local churches praying for him last week, and um, I'll just give you a little update as to where he is now. He's still in hospital. He will be for a while. He, um, he's, he was suffering with some delirium this week, which is quite normal for such an operation. Um, but he's, uh, on Friday, he was sedated because he was having some digestive issues. I won't go into detail. Um, and so he's currently unconscious, but the doctors are happy with his progress. And uh, hopefully he will make a full recovery, but it will be a few months. So do please keep praying for him. It was, <laughs> it's been quite a week. Um, but last week when I did go into the hospital and I did see dad, I was very blessed to be able to see him before he went into his operation. I was very aware in that moment that it could have been the last time that I spoke to him. He was about to go into an operation which few people survive and God blessed us that he was conscious and that he knew I was there and that I was able to speak to him. But I knew that it was possible that I could be saying goodbye to him for the last time. And I know that many of you in this room have been in that situation. Many of you had said goodbye for the last time to loved ones. Goodbye is a normal part of the human experience. It seems that our lives are made up of them. In the Bible passage that we're going to be looking at today, that is Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, we're going to be looking at one of the most remarkable goodbyes in history. Over the last few weeks, we've been working our way through Acts chapter 1, um, leading up to Pentecost, which is in just a few weeks now. Uh, and um, at the very start of this series, Dave took us through verses 4 to 5 where Jesus promised that there would be a baptism of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit in power upon his church. Two weeks ago, Dave again looked at verses 6 to 8, where he corrects his disciples' thinking about when the kingdom of God would be coming fully. He promised the power of the Holy Spirit again, and he commissioned them to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. And last week, because of God's sovereignty, we didn't look at verses 9 to 11. Instead, we looked at verses 12 to 14, where we saw how the disciples returned to Jerusalem and were in the upper room, devoting themselves to prayer. This week, we're going to be looking at 9 to 11. So let's read Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Please open your Bibles. We're going to be spending a bit of time there this morning. It says this, verse 9. And when he had said these things, that's Jesus, after the conversation where he commissions his disciples, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Here we're seeing Jesus' final goodbye to his disciples as he goes up into heaven. And as far as exits go, this is pretty impressive. 
Now, can you imagine, just for a moment, after this sermon, I just kind of raised my hands and just ascended up into the rafters. It'd be pretty dramatic, wouldn't it? No, don't worry, I'm not going to do that. But let's make no mistake here. Something supernatural is happening here. There are no hidden strings, no raising platform. Even Dynamo couldn't pull this one off. Jesus outright defies gravity. And so this is an extraordinary exit. That's the first point of the sermon, the title of the sermon. It's an extraordinary exit. And it's good for us to take a look at this passage together because Jesus' ascension is something that we often skip over. Often when we're thinking about Jesus' work, the gospel, we, we look at the crucifixion, Jesus dying for our sins, that's amazing. And then we look at the resurrection, Jesus rising from the dead, that's awesome. But then we kind of just skip forward until, until we get to Pentecost, which is also amazing, the fall of the Holy Spirit. But before we get to Pentecost, we have Jesus' ascension. And it is part of Christ's salvation work, just as much as his crucifixion and his resurrection and Pentecost is. And so I want to take note of three things this passage tells us about Jesus' ascension. The first thing I'd like to point out is that this exit, this ascension, was visible. Seems obvious, right? But Luke, the author of Acts, seems to be at pains to tell us that the disciples saw this happen. Look, verse 9. As they were looking on, and then and a cloud took him out of their sight. Verse 10, and while they were gazing into heaven. And then verse 11, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. That's five times in three verses that Luke refers to them seeing Jesus. Now Luke has always been concerned to show that the things he talks about in, in his gospel and in the book of Acts is history. And so he continually emphasizes the presence of eyewitnesses, the people who told him what happened afterwards. He was writing about 30 years after these events. And, and so he wants to make sure that the people who read his, his work didn't think he was making it up. He wanted them to know that they could go and find these eyewitnesses and they would confirm what he had written to them. And so what he's saying is that this miraculous ascension really happened. Why? Because there were 11 eyewitnesses who saw it all happen. This wasn't a group hallucination. This wasn't a made-up myth or a legend. This is a historical fact recorded here by Luke, the historian. And by the way, the apostles weren't stupid. They knew that what Jesus was doing was impossible. Sure, they might not have understood the laws of gravity the same way that we might today, but they knew that human beings don't just go up. They, they knew that. And so this makes this account all the more credible because they stuck to it. They stuck to this story, no matter how outlandish it seems. But also, the fact that the ascension was visible, that you could see it, was an incredible act of grace from Jesus. Think about this. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples over a period of 40 days. And, and sometimes he would just appear among them and then disappear. If Jesus had not ascended visibly in front of them, but just disappeared and gone off to heaven privately, then the disciples would have been left wondering if and when he would come back, not knowing that this departure was final. In this way, the disciples knew that this would be the last time they'd see Jesus this side of death. They could, they could be sure that Jesus had really returned to heaven, and so they should stop waiting for him to reappear just suddenly among them, like he had been recently. And so it was a visible exit. Secondly, we notice that Jesus' ascension was bodily. He had a human body. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he did not cease to be human. You know, we might imagine that Jesus' human body is like a cocoon. And, and when Jesus ascended, it was like a butterfly coming out of a cocoon. But we might imagine that Jesus was trapped in his physical body, but then he went to heaven and he was freed from that reality. But that is simply not the case. Jesus' body and all ascended into heaven. And, and so what does this tell us? Well, this tells us that heaven is a physical place. 
We are physical creatures. We, we take up space. So, you know, I've taken up this space, and then I come over here, and I'm taking up some new space over here. There is a limit to how many of us could fit in this room because we all take up space. But God is spirit, and spiritual beings don't take up space. But Jesus is human, and he does take up space. And so we've got this God-man who goes into heaven. He is somewhere right now in heaven. He has a human body there. Now listen, heaven is not a place that we can see. It's not a place that we can touch. It's not a place that we can get to using human technology. We're not going to be foolish enough to think that heaven is in outer space as the Soviets foolishly thought when they, they sent a man into space and said they had disproved God because they didn't see heaven up there. We, I mean, we don't know the science of it. We don't know the way it works, but my personal opinion is that it's in another dimension, if you will, kind of to bring sci-fi into it. A reality beyond ours, but it's still a place, a physical place. And the fact that Jesus ascended with a body gives us assurance. It's really important. It means that Jesus is still our mediator between us and God. He still represents us. He is still a human being. And so it tells us that as long as Jesus is a human body, which is forever, we are saved. We are forgiven. We are adopted. We are represented before God by Jesus. And so Jesus made a visible exit. He made a bodily exit. And now, thirdly, Jesus' exit was a glorious exit. If we look at the end of verse 9, it says this, And a cloud took him out of their sight. We see this detail that Luke includes, that there is a cloud that obscures Jesus from the disciples' sight. Why did, why did Luke say that? Now, we English, we're no strangers to clouds. <coughs> I mean, it's a lovely day today, but normally we have typically overcast weather outside that makes us all miserable and blocks the sun out. But this cloud here was not like the clouds that you see outside. Throughout the Bible, we have this imagery of a cloud, and nearly every time it shows up, it is when God is manifesting his glory. It's known as the Shekinah glory. And we see it in Exodus, when God leads his people out of Egypt, the, the pillar of cloud by day. We see it when God's presence comes to dwell in the tabernacle and then in the temple. We see it on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus is transformed before the disciples and this cloud comes down as the glory of God shines around. And now we see it here at the ascension, God's glory in a cloud. What does this mean? It means that God the Son, who had previously concealed his glory in a human body, who had humbled himself, was now returning to heaven in glory. Think of it this way. Imagine I had the most beautiful diamond you'd ever seen. It's there. It has no imperfections. The light refracts off it perfectly. It's beautiful, worth millions. Now imagine that I put it in this imaginary brown paper bag. Now from outside the imaginary brown paper bag, you would not be able to see the beautiful diamond. It's still valuable, it's still pretty, but you can't see it. It's not on display. When Jesus came to earth and was born into the world as a human being, his glory, God's glory, was concealed in a brown paper bag. The glory was contained in a human body. But when he ascended, Jesus' glory was revealed. The diamond was revealed. But instead of the brown paper bag just being removed, it was transformed into a bag made of golden silk, beautifully bejeweled, encrusted with rubies and emeralds. When Jesus ascended, he, body and all, returned to his glory. And a cloud represents this. And perhaps it concealed him because it's just something that the disciples could just not see this side of eternity. Now Jesus sits on his throne in heaven, ruling the world in glory. He sits in all his splendor and majesty. And if we were to see him in heaven, he would be glorious. 
more beautiful than the finest diamond, more valuable than all the gold in the world. Jesus, God Almighty. And so we've seen that Jesus' ascension was visible. It was bodily and it was glorious. But as we carry on into verse 10, we see that two men appearing white appear, uh, wearing white appear. Now, whenever the Bible speaks this way, it's normally referring to angels. And so angels would often appear to announce great works of God. They'd be messengers of God. They normally had something important to say. And so what do these two angels have to say that is important? See, it says this in verse 11. And said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? What an odd question. Why are they standing? Well, I don't know, because Jesus has just ascended. Isn't that an obvious question? Isn't that a silly question to ask? If I were one of the disciples there, I probably would have thought, what a stupid question. But I think the rest of this verse gives us a clue as to why they ask this, as to why they're there. It says this, This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now let's just take a moment to consider that these 11 disciples had been with Jesus for the best part of three years. They had followed him through the highs and lows of his ministry. They would watched him do remarkable miracles. They'd cast and cast out demons and heal many people. They'd listened to his wise and challenging teachings. Their hearts raced when he spoke about the kingdom of God. And gradually they came to understand that this man in front of them was the Messiah, God's son. And yet these same men sat with Jesus as he broke the bread and he blessed the wine, telling them how his body would be broken and his blood poured out in the same way for them. And 24 hours later, Jesus was dead. An innocent man sentenced to death, beaten, mocked, scorned, crucified. Yet... Three days later, their mourning turned to astonishment and joy as they discovered that the Lord Jesus had risen from the dead. That was 40 days ago. But now, Jesus is leaving. All they had been through together, how could he now leave them? How could he leave the 11 to carry on this mission without him? How would they even be able to do it without Jesus leading them? Perhaps that is how these 11 were feeling. A sense of loss and sadness as they realized that Jesus was gone. And they did not know when they would next see him, if at all. And so that's why the angels turn up. They turn up to give them a kick up the backside. They have a job to do. They've got to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. They can't just stand out on the Mount of Olives looking into the sky. Jesus has given them a job to do. And more than that, he's promised them the Holy Spirit. They're going to be empowered to do the job. But they don't just receive a kick up the backside. They also receive a word of comfort. Verse 11. This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He's coming back. He's coming back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Someone's paying attention. Jesus is coming back. And in verse 11, the angel said that he will return the same way that he came. We've seen an extraordinary exit. And now we're going to see that Jesus is going to have a remarkable return. I know I've got the alliteration down this morning. This remarkable return will be like his extraordinary exit. Now, to be clear, it's not going to be exactly the same. Jesus ascended alone, but he's going to return with a heavenly host. But in the same way that Jesus' ascension was visible, bodily, and glorious, so his return will also be, and then so. Jesus' return will be a visible occasion. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 says this, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Eleven people saw Jesus ascend, but the whole world will see Jesus when he returns. I'm not sure how it will work in truth. I'm not sure how it will be possible for everyone on earth to see Jesus when he returns. 
my personal theory is that maybe in this time we're finally beginning to understand how that might be possible with the advent of the internet and mass media. But what do I know? But what does this mean for us right here? Well, I don't know if you've ever had this thought before. I, I'm going to own up a bit here. What if you th I thought, you know, what if, what if Jesus has already come back? What if he's come back and we missed it? What if, what if, he's, what if he's come back and, and I was asleep or whatever, or maybe it happened before my lifetime? Uh, perhaps you've had that thought in your head. I mean, personally, I think everyone has. I just don't want to admit it. But you need not worry. When Jesus comes back, we're going to know about it. It will be a history-changing event that everyone on earth will know about it. In the same way that we'd know about it if an elephant came charging into the sanctuary right now, we'll know about Christ's return. It will be obvious. And it will be an actual return, not a metaphorical return. You know, you can sometimes read some theologians who deny that Jesus will return. They say that perhaps Jesus' return was the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost, or it was some kind of metaphorical return of the world becoming a utopia. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus will actually return, visibly, and every eye will see him. It'll be a visible return. And just as Jesus' ascension was in a human body, he will also return in a human body. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 says this, And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. One like a son of man. Jesus will be in the same body he resurrected in when he returns. Jesus is and always will be human. And as I've already said, Jesus' incarnation is permanent for eternity. It will never change. He will always be human. This is so important for us to remember. Jesus is human. And this is true when he returns too. This means, by the way, that when Jesus returns, he won't need to be born into the world again through a woman. He, he won't need to grow up from childhood again. He won't need to die on the cross again. He won't need to do all these things. He will return as he went, a fully grown, resurrected man. So Jesus' return will be visible and bodily. And finally, and perhaps most obviously at all, of, of all, just as Jesus' exit was glorious, so his return will be glorious. And then some. Again, Daniel 7.13. And behold, with the clouds of heaven. There's that cloud again. The symbol of God's glory on display. Jesus, when he comes, he will be glorious. Far more glorious than what the disciples witnessed at the ascension. It will be so much more glorious. Honestly, I can't find words to describe this any better than what the Bible says. And so I'm going to invite Steve to come up because we're going to go into a song after this to finish. But I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 19. This is a description of Jesus at his return. <clears throat> then I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus has gone to heaven. He went visibly, he went bodily, he went in glory. And he is with us now by his Holy Spirit. He's in the room, this glorious King. He is praying for us. He is interceding with the Father for us right now. He is representing us to the Father. He has guaranteed eternity to us in his own body. And Jesus will be returning. We don't know when. It could be tomorrow. It could be in a thousand years. But we do have a job to do in the meantime. I recognize that this has been quite heady stuff 
this morning. Sometimes it's good to just take a look at doctrine and what we believe, but this actively affects the way that we lead our lives. We are to be witnesses to the Lord Jesus until he returns, telling everyone who will listen, and maybe those who won't, about the Lord Jesus, what he has done, who he is, where he is right now, the salvation that he offers. So let's be busy when he returns. And when he does return, how glorious it will be. A visible return, every eye will see him. A bodily return, the son of man, a glorious return. He is coming on the clouds.